From Chicago, welcome to 3 Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. There's so many layers to that onion, right? In terms of what you got to consider. Um, it's very, very challenging. And it's very multidisciplinary, which is kind of fun. It's cliche to say, you know, like, oh, you know, you have to have, know everything to do additive. Um, but th there's an element of truth, right? Because, you know, the metallurgy is intense, right? It's non-equilibrium processes. You've got, you know, thousands of wild, miles of weld seam, basically, in your parts. Like, you're flying, if you put one of those on the aircraft, you're basically flying a giant weld nugget. That was Paul Wilson. Paul's part of the Boeing Research and Technology Metallic Materials and Process Teams in St. Louis. The focus of his work is finding, developing, and implementing novel alloys and processes for aircraft programs. Currently, he's working on developing additive manufacturing processes and novel additive alloys for enterprise deployment. Paul joins the show today to talk about metal materials in AM, as well as the process of qualifying these materials for aerospace applications. Before we get started, head over to www.3degreescompany.com and subscribe to the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the show anywhere you download your podcast, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Stitcher. All right, Paul, thank you so much for joining the show today. I'm excited for the conversation. So let's just start kind of like we start with most of our guests. And I think you're, uh, me being a material scientist and you're a metallurgist, I think we've... Uh, I, the show highly biases towards materials people. So I'm glad you can fit, fit the mold today, but kind of where did you get your start in, in, in additive or kind of even kind of before that, like what, what was the pull towards materials and metallurgy? Yeah, it's interesting. So I, I got my start in metallurgy, you know, an undergraduate. Um, I kind of looking at colleges, you know, I decided I want to do engineering, right. I hadn't really decided yet what kind of engineering, but I knew vaguely, yes, technical things, you know, engineering, that type of stuff. Uh, so uh, I ended up uh, choosing uh, Colorado School of Mines, um, you know, in Golden, Colorado. Uh, I grew up in Colorado, um, so it was kind of a, a natural fit. It's a solid school. I'll plug it here. It's a really good school, in my opinion. Maybe, you know, go ore diggers. Uh, ended you guys up there. Have the Adapt Center, right? Like the Additive Center. Yeah, Is that what it's called. Is yeah, Adapt. Yeah, it oh. came about a few years after I started my undergraduate, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. Might even ju been just before I started my master's degree there. Um, kind of giving away the the, the ending there. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, yeah, so I, I started there. Uh, I didn't actually start out in metallurgy. Weirdly, I was in geophysics of all things when I was initially declared in. But you know, like any freshman, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so I started to explore the depart departments and there was happened to be a friend of mine, um, freshman year that was in the metallurgy department. Um, and he's like, Hey man, you should, you know, come check it out. Um, and, and I did, and they were fantastic. The work seemed to be like the, the perfect combination of things that I, I enjoyed doing. Like the, the thing I was struggling with finding a major elsewhere was finding the kind of like, I was like, I like aspects of this. I like aspects of, you know, physics. I like parts of chemical. I like, you know, things, but nothing was holistically felt like, yes, that's what I want to do. And then when I kind of ran into the materials engineering department at School of Mines, I was like, yeah, that this, this is cool stuff. Like this is the type of work that, you know, I want to do. Um, and it f fed into sort of a childhood interest of, um, I, I always liked blacksmith type stuff, you know, dorking around with metals in the backyard, if you could. Um, um, I enjoy, uh, you know, historical uh, studies and recreations kind of on the side. And so it kind of fed into that. And I was like, you know, this is, you know, this modern version of doing all that cool stuff. So um, got involved in the department, um, kind of didn't really look back. I, I lo loved it. Um, did a couple internships during my undergraduate there, uh, one with Special Metals Corporation out in Huntington, West Virginia, working with uh, nickel alloys. Uh, that was a good experience. And then that led me to uh, working up at Boeing, actually, as an uh, intern um, up in uh, Puget Sound area on the, the, the metallic materials team up there. Uh, that kind of work was more an R&D, and that's what got me on the path to grad school, as I realized in my work there that I, I really wanted to um, really wanted to kind of be on the more R&D end of materials, uh, kind of more transition technology rather than be more on the application. I'm not saying that's maybe forever, but I, I really like that that space. It's really fun, very challenging, always new problems and new things to find, which is which is part of the fun of being an engineer, right? 
So um, I decided then to proceed with getting my master's degree um, also at the College School of Mines. And I ended up doing that in the Center for Advanced Non-Ferrous Structural Alloys. Bit of a mouthful, um, but CAMPSA is how you, how you say it, uh, that acronym, um, which was uh, not exclusively aerospace focused, but it had um, heavy aerospace involvement from some of the membership. So I got on an industrial project there um, and, and Boeing was actually one of the industrial mentors for that project, which kind of strengthened the, the connection after the internship. And uh, I just, uh, so I worked through my master's, graduated and they kind of recruited me out to the, the St. Louis region due to some of the re, you know, shifting and kind of repositioning in terms of uh, 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 Boeing research and technology. Uh, in, in my m master's degree, I actually didn't work on additive. I didn't work on you know aluminum. I didn't work on titanium. I worked on, uh, uh, well, it's changed names maybe by now, but um, I, I worked on uh, sort of combinatorial techniques for uh, development of high entropy alloys of what they were called at the time. I think they've now kind of shifted to multi-principle element alloys or maybe constant, complex concentrated alloys if you talk to the Air Force. Um, so I worked on a technique to do diffusion multiples. So, you know, think diffusion couple um, with multiple components that are all sort of intersecting at complex interfaces. So my master's degree was mostly focused on, you know, how do you make those samples, which turns out to be um, non-trivial. Um, a lot of frustrated hours spent in the lab with a lot of failed specimens. Uh, great learning experience there. Um, but at the end of the day, I got a technique that worked and I was able to, you know, show some, I'd say, initial results um, that kind of was able to lead into some some papers there. Um, so it was a fun project, um, but not, not additive related. Um, and it was working mainly with model alloys. So it wasn't even really um, engineering alloys um, necessarily. Uh, but yeah, that's the, the, once I kind of wrapped that up, I, you know, I got recruited out to Boeing um, on the, uh, basically uh, the, it's called the next gen metals team out in St. Louis. Um, and that group's mandate, um, and I'm still kind of on that team, although I'm now on the additive side of that spectrum, um, and so kind of the gives you the lead into additive, um, is, is very much responsible for a lot of the um, new alloy and processing techniques um, going from kind of that university stage. That group's job is to kind of see it to transition to a customer program, right? So kind of TRL three through six, the so-called valley of death of uh of uh, technology development. That's where that group sits. And that's so where for, I got my so start. What's, so for those who may not be familiar with, with TRL, what, what does that mean? Yeah, technology readiness level, right? Um, we love our TLAs in um, aerospace. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, so technology readiness level is essentially, you know, how close is the technology to basically production implementation at scale. There's different ratings of implementation, but basically that's the short that's the short version. It's basically how ready is this technology to be put onto a production application. The the government uses it, a lot of aerospace companies use it. I think automotive might, I'm not as familiar. Um, and certainly different companies have different levels they need for certain applications. Um, but if you're gonna look at the scale, TRL three, right, is kind of what we call discovery. You have a proof of concept, it's real, it's not a fairy tale. Um, TRL-6 is kind of the first um, kind of transition milestone where you say, all right, this has been proven out. Um, it, it now can be used on products. Um, and then generally 7, 8, 9, 10 are various degrees of maturity in the production system where, where, where TRL-10 is like something that's been around for you know, a long time. It's well understood. It's well developed. Um, and then kind of lesser degrees as you go down. That's that's approximately it. I'm probably sure there's some uh, TRL practitioner out there that'll slap my hand for that. but it's approximately right. Sure. I mean, that's always been the interesting thing about kind of, I've not spent a ton of time in aerospace or kind of that, that environment. I've kind of been around it through other entities like America makes and, and things, but you hear some of these acronyms that are thrown out and like, oh, I've heard that one before. I can't remember what it was. Um, but as you're going through kind of your early career, you kind of get a lot of hands-on kind of practical experience. It sounds like, was there kind of, the thing that I always found with materials or metallurgy kind of going through kind of where you went as well is that it's, it's specific, but it's so broad and could be applied to so many different industries. Was there like, did you have an inherent pull towards kind of aerospace where you are now? Was there ever anything kind of inherent about the problems that would be in that particular industry that, that you need to, to kind of come to Boeing and, and stay there for a while? Yeah. Um, 
you're right. I mean, that's actually one of the things that drew me to metallurgy is um, what isn't made of materials, you know, and the periodic table is um, a lot of metallic elements you'll see on there. Um, our polymer friends um, have very select few. We have the whole table to play with. So um, I, I, and I enjoy that aspect of it. So you're absolutely right. Uh, in terms of specifically to, to aerospace, um, my dad worked in the aerospace industry. Um, and so it was always sort of something kind of, uh, you know, call it, call it grew up around um, in terms of, you know, uh, the environment and plus, you know, what kid doesn't like airplanes and things that go fast. I was definitely amongst those. Um, so when I got into aerospace or when I got into metals um, and metallurgy, I, I, you know, kind of my thoughts ran to, all right, you know, aerospace materials, you know, faster, stronger, lighter, you know, uh, tough environments, difficult applications, um, cutting edge type work. Uh, so I have to admit, when I started putting my sights on aerospace um, materials, I had really zero understanding of what that actually means or entails. And it's it's a whole different world that you, you've you got to learn um, kind of a crash course over the last you know parts of my career. Um, but it's a it's it's a very challenging place to work, but it's a very rewarding place to work when you, when you get those wins. Um, so it started with just, Hey, that looks cool. And it's developed into sort of an appreciation for, you know, sort of what the aerospace does and what you got to do to, you know, get a technology moving ahead. So, um, right. and, and I yeah. imagine before, or kind of, as you were talking about technology readiness levels for kind of ideas and concepts, you have the same idea for, materials that go into parts that go into planes or whatever vehicle it, it might be. And right. kind of w with additive, maybe at a kind of 30,000 foot view, like what are some of the challenges that kind of you see on a day-to-day -day basis with kind of materials and qualification kind of, and that ecosystem in, in the aerospace world? Is there kind of, you have regulation obviously, but kind of what's the, are there kind of day-to-day -day challenges that you see that always pop up in the, mm. the meetings you're having? Yeah, that's um, that's a broad question right there. Um, there's a lot of ways to answer that. Um, yeah, it, you know, AM is, um, you know, it's a very, it's, it's a very powerful technology. Um, it, there, there's also all the, um, call it cliche things you can say about it. Um, you know, and I feel like those that have been working in additive for a while, we kind of start to roll our eyes a little bit um, when we hear those in terms of like the design for AM and all these things. Um, but I think what the, you know, aerospace industry um, and a lot of the companies that are looking to scale and apply additive at a proper industrial scale, right, are all kind of working around and is really stable, repeatable, reliable processes. That's the key to it, right? If you don't have something that you can stand behind in terms of quality, if you don't have something that you can say to your customer, to your regulatory agency, that you can prove that that part you're making is correct and right and meets your quality requirements every time, and that you have a objective evidence for when you can find that it's not that is a very that that's that so it separates you know making a very very pretty um paperweight and an aerospace part right is that quality that stability that repeatability and so i think fundamentally that's what the industry right now is grappling with most um I'm not saying there aren't ways to solve it or even there aren't any even narrow applications that have solved it but there are um, a broad-based general like, hey, let's plug and play. We know how to do this process every time. I'm not sure if we're quite there yet. Um, maybe I'm climbing out onto a limb. Somebody can saw off after me. Um, but I think that's the key challenge right now with the industry is it's really taking it from that onesie twosies, that occasional success, that rapid prototyping, that case study, that demo, all the way to we're making thousands of these parts a year and we can do it whenever we want type of thing, right? That, that true scale. And there's so many kind of decision points that make that a challenge along the way that you or I as a materials engineer have limited availability or like insight on it. So right. At some point someone chooses a 
platform machine or material that then they want to qualify or like that may fit the bill, but all the ecosystems in terms of the different materials, the different machines, reliability, kind of frame some of that initial thinking in terms of, okay, how far can we push it to get quality or what's the bounding box and how many tensile bars do I have to build to prove that this <laughs> right. build plate is viable or 60% of this build plate is viable, 40% is not. And so like that's from, from where I've sat, I mean, and going through some of these processes with different technologies, that's, there's so many decision points that impact that final qualification or wherever yeah. production it might go. And it all wraps up into that stability question, right? Because you're right. There's so many layers to that onion, right? In terms of what you got to consider. Um, it's very, very challenging. And it's very multidisciplinary, which is kind of fun. It's cliche to say, you know, like, oh, you know, you have to have know everything to do additive. Um, but th there's an element of truth, right? Because, you know, the metallurgy is intense, right? It's non-equilibrium processes. You've got, you know, thousands of wild, miles of weld seam, basically, in your parts. Like, you're flying, if you put one of those on the aircraft, you're basically flying a giant weld nugget, right? That's what I always like to, to say. And it, it's basically true, right? As, if, assuming you're using a, you know, a, a, you know, a melt pool process, I guess you, you might be. But the majority of processes are right now. Um, and the metallurgy is tough. I mean, the design for AM is no picnic, right? You've got to really know what you're, you're talking about before you, you mess things up. The inspection of parts is no joke. Um, you've really got to understand what your machine's doing. You've got to understand your, you know, um, you know, what your optics, what your, 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 your consistencies up to, you've got to understand how do you document and control those things. Like it spans, you know, the whole system, you know, you can't just do, Hey, I know the metallurgy really well and call it a day, right? Because that metallurgy is going to be impacted by what your designer goes off and does, you know, it, you've got to talk to each other and it's got to be well understood. It's got to be a strong ecosystem to implement additive. Sure. And even, I mean, you guys as Boeing, like massive, one of the biggest companies in the world, like you're kind of top in aerospace. And, but at the same time, I mean, you have a partner network of suppliers that produce parts for you to make the plane, right? You guys don't make every single part that goes on a right. 737. And so it, the distribution of that knowledge and qualification pathways is, is also important to say like, hey, once you get to a point where, hey, we've got this alloy, we know that it works generally in this system, like, but we need someone else to produce the 10,000 parts because we don't have the bandwidth to do that. We want to be able to do new materials and new processes like mm -hmm. what's that what are you seeing on, on your end i know like we work with a lot of small medium-sized manufacturers that are kind of on the fence of saying like hey we see additive coming down the pike but like hey like the investment's expensive to get a machine like do we need a someone like you to have like a metallurgy background to make sure we're qualified and like that's overwhelming at, at some points do you, like what do you see on your end i mean you guys are going through some of the the nitty gritty and getting parts qualified and you have successes, but like, what's, can you speak about some of the, the activities you guys are doing along that, that path? You're just to clarify, you're sort of asking in regards to say the supply base yeah, maturity. I know, I know you guys are doing some, some work and, and helping push the industry forward on, on that front as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Implementing AM, you know, with, uh, with suppliers is, is, um, is a challenge, right? Um, keep using that word but you know aim is challenging um but, but yeah you you sort of really need to i've seen the most successful times where we've worked with a you know a supplier it, it really takes a close sense of partnership and collaboration right you, you can't toss something over the wall and expect somebody just to pick it up and run and implement it where i don't think really any anybody's there right um, in terms of being able to do that. Um, so, you know, when we work with a supplier, it, it needs to be, you know, collaborative and, you know, and um, open as much as we can with in the restrictions of all the fun IP barriers we like to set up in the industry, which, you know, I'm not going to comment on, but they're there. Um, so we, we, we have to be cognizant of that. But within those frameworks, you know, you, you need to be open, you need to communicate. Um, and, Part of our job, you know, within within Boeing as technologists is to make sure that when we identify a new partner, right, to work with, or we have a strategic supplier or whoever that may be, and whatever technology, whether it's AM or not, is that we sufficiently have 
the knowledge, the, the, the written specifications, and the ability to then transfer that out into the supply base. And sometimes that does involve, say, teaching a new supplier, like, hey, guys, no, this is, this is the way you've got to do it because we've learned X, Y, Z. Um, you know, and so we transfer those requirements to, to the supplier and make sure that they understand them and they're cognizant and that they, they, they're, they're with us, right? You got to bring them along. Yeah. Is there anything you've learned along that pathway or kind of just inherent Boeing knowledge that like you wish suppliers would know about before kind of getting into additive or into kind of conversations with you guys? Is there some common thing that, that always Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually. Um, but hopefully, yeah. It, aerospace is a difficult place to print parts, right? Uh, I feel like they're, I'm not going to, I'm not naming any names or saying anything, but I think there are some companies that get involved that sometimes think like, Hey, I've got a, I've got a printer. Um, I made a part that looks good. Let's go print parts for aerospace. And I think that's thankfully, I think dying off a little bit, but what that is not taking into account is the quality system that needs to be put into place, the traceability that needs to be put into place, you know, the QMS, the, the certs, the, you know, ISO 9001, AS 9100, you know, you and then all the different sub operations that must support AM, right? Heat treatment, um, support material removal, surface finishing, um, radiographic inspection, um, surface inspection, uh, you know, all those things that support the entire aerospace quality ecosystem that supplier needs to be able to handle um, to some degree. Now, it's not expected that they ne necessarily have all the organic capacity to do that, right? And unless they're fully vertically integrated, it's it's unlikely they do, but they need to have sort of a, an understanding of where to go get those things, how they handle those and how they interact in their quality system. So it's kind of the, not just making the part, it's everything around the part is sometimes neglected or not thought through um, in terms of how you actually deliver that um, with the appropriate pedigree and paperwork. Um, so that's all, that is underestimated. Sometimes the longest things to actually get done are not related to additive sometimes and not all the time, but like you'll have it like, Hey, there is a, you know, our specs will reference other specs. Did you guys read all of the specs that those specs reference? And then did you read the specs that those specs reference, right? You've got to trace all that spec chain down to really understand the requirements of what we're asking for you, right? We might give you a line that's this long about what you do, and you might have to read 60 documents to go do it. So to truly understand the requirements um, and, un and it to deliver to those requirements requires a very broader, a broader understanding of what's actually um, going to be required for that AM part. And so companies that are new to aerospace, um, it's not that they can't learn it, but there's a learning curve. There's, a, there, there's definitely a learning curve in turn, trying to understand what those requirements are, how we, cons how we deliver those requirements and how we expect them to be consumed to deliver a part. Do you think there are different, the right term is on-ramps, like within Boeing, I mean, you guys are a huge company, so you have, I mean, there's commercial planes, there's defense vehicles there's also drones or presumably like in aerospace generally there's drones and space systems and other things that may or may not have as stringent requirements right where people may not be involved but a lot of that still translates but do you, is there i mean i was out in colorado the the other week speaking of colorado and there's a lot of space companies kind of popping up and kind of that industry is huge around there and a lot of additive use but is there anything kind of tying it to like, it's a little bit, it's different when you're shooting a satellite up in the air than <laughs> when you're shooting yeah. a person, right? Sure. Um, yeah, there's different burdens of proof, I think is the right way of putting that um, for yeah, different types good. of platforms. Um, and that, that very much depends upon the customer. You know, are you building something for the Air Force? Are you building something for the Navy? Are you building something for commercial flights? Are you building... NASA, you know, is it regulated by NASA? You know, is it a commercial satellite? Is it a military satellite? Um, all those things, um, there's a very diverse set of customers out there in aerospace. Um, and all of them have their own um, comfort level with the technology, right? And they have their own restrictions on the technology use and the different classifications of criticality of the part. Um, and then, you know, there's different, yeah, there, there's basically, it, there's a lot of variety there. Um, and so I would say there are applications that are easier to get on than others, 
but that's not to say they're easy, right? It's like a, it's a different set of hard, right? And so it's kind of picking your poison on what you want to do. Um, now, I would say a lot of those, particularly on the, you know, smaller, more niche, niche applications, it's easier to make the case, I'd say, to get on with additive, where you're dealing with, say, Boeing commercial airplanes, right? You, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to compete, right? Right. There are no, fr- there is no free lunch, right? Um, it, it's very, you, you've got to make the case. Otherwise, what does make the case will go, right? Um, and you've got to be able to keep up with a fairly high production rate as aerospace goes, right? I mean, back in the day, well, you know, a couple of years ago, 60 737s a month, you know, you've got to keep up with that many ship sets a month if you're going to make it on that platform. And you've got to show you can do it and do it reliably. Otherwise, you start stopping airplanes. And if you start stopping airplanes, you will quickly find yourself off the program, I would imagine. So, in terms of the uh, the, the difficulty, um, uh, it, it ramps, and so there's varying degrees and different types of difficulty, right? So maybe a defense application has a super super high performance requirement um, that's very difficult to meet, but they only need six of them, right, for the whole life of the program. That's a very different challenge than making you know several hundred thousand over the life of a commercial program um, and, and doing it consistently and having the infrastructure to do it. So yeah, uh, I guess that was a long winded answer to say. Um, yeah, there's different barriers, and you, you got to pick your poison on which one you want to attack. Sure, and, and maybe getting into the weeds a little bit too on just some of these specifications. I mean, we try and keep up with some of the ASTM standards and what the FAA puts out on, on some of the guidance for for additive. But as you kind of get into the weeds, like, and, and I've sat on some of these ASTM calls, and they're in some cases riveting, in some cases not so much. But like the amount of detail that's it goes into defining a specific term, location in the build, or what you have to document for each build is is extremely cumbersome. I mean, you you probably live that every day, and like the amount of data that comes off of a single build that you could possibly look at is if you're tracking all the layers and things. It could be in the terabytes, and so mm-hmm. kind of stiffing through that in terms of both a balance of making it efficient to go through, and but also safe is probably a balance you you deal with all the time but kind of from a metallurgy standpoint like are there like what's your kind of general approach when you're kind of building out some of these kind of does or looking into new new experiments and new new metals are there kind of a framework that you follow or are there kind of just best principles best practices that, that you like to to kind of keep in the back of your head uh for so for new materials development, right? Um, that's a that's a challenging um, field, right? Um, yeah, I, I suppose there's probably some you know principles we follow, but again, you, you sort of you got to follow your sort of engineering judgment to a degree of what material you're dealing with and what level of comfort you have with it. Um, and you know, additive you got to check your corners. <laughs> That's what I'll say is there's a lot of ways you can be surprised by things that you assume to happen. You know, say you think, Oh, rot product that, that never happens. Don't worry about it. And you're like, well, mm, yeah, it did. Um, so you've got to be meticulous. Um, you've got to be curious. Um, you've got to be open-minded and you've got to always check your assumptions when you're dealing with a new material in terms of development. Um, assumptions kind of, they get you. They get you quickly, um, and so you metallurgy first principles are always important, right? Your classic physical metallurgy one hundred and one class, whenever, wherever, and whenever you took that, that's that's your that's your guiding star, right? Um, how does you know? It, and then then you got to kind of take it to the next level of you know thinking through essentially these complex um, you know um, high energy non equilibrium processes and figuring out you know how you apply those principles correctly. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, I don't think I give any specific examples, but I have um, had my own scars I could probably show off in terms of in, in that realm. Um, it's a challenging field. And then when you get into parameter development, oh man, that's you, we could probably have a couple hour discussion on how you properly do parameter development for AM and all the things you got to think of. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question particularly well or if you want to follow up there. But Yeah, no, I mean, I think, <laughs> and, and some of the folks that are listening may even be new to kind of parameter development, but when you say parameter development, that essentially means kind of what are my bounding box for the machine? What laser power? Right. What? What's the recipe? Yep. 
yep. What's the recipe of what I want to use? And with every material, it's going to be a little, it's going to be different um, depending on what that, that looks like. And so finding that tuned recipe is very important part of the process um, to scaling something. You've got to understand those settings. You've got to understand the robustness. You've got to understand why you're in the space you are. And you've got in what's paired with that and sometimes forgotten is you've got to understand what the goalpost is, right? What is an acceptable parameter, right? Um, there's going to be trade-offs with your parameter set. What do you want that parameter set to perform to? Are you looking for max quality, max speed? You know, it might be automotive and you're like, hey, 3% porosity, whatever, you know. It might be some other application, but for aerospace, right, what's the driving requirement we're working to? What's success? If you don't have success defined, you're, you're, you're not going to find it because you don't know what it is. For sure. And do you think that idea of success has evolved over even the time that you've been been an additive? Has that, like, people gotten more clear on what that is? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think there's been additional learnings and um, uh, requirements written around what actually we need out of a given parameter set, right? Um, as we do more applications, as we find more problems, <laughs> as we find, uh, you know, more things, we, 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 we continue to expand our mindset in terms of like what we need to consider, what we need to worry about, what we need to define, what we need to search for in a parameter development. So it's an ever, it's an ever evolving cycle. I don't think we've ever, I don't think we have or ever will arrive at a final, you know, a universal method for parameter development. I think we'll arrive at, hey, here's generally how you should go about it. But when you encounter something new, you got to be creative and figure it out. And there's a lot of smart people that are a lot of fun to work with in, in those, in those spaces. So I've got kind of one last question kind of reflecting on your career in additive and kind of your, your future career and in the space and whatever, whether it's additive or metallurgy or whatever it may be, but as what sort of advice would you give kind of people kind of coming up the ranks and, and looking at material science or added manufacturing maybe with or without a college degree, are there certain kind of roles that you see like, Hey, like this is going to be around for a while. Like we don't have enough people that know this, or if you really want to get into this, like the way to stand out is to take this class or take this degree. Mm. Is there some trend that you see your piece of advice that you could share in, in your own experience? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, I, I actually fell into additive, right. My school actually had school of minds. Um, if there's any, faculty from the School of Mines listening, I apologize in advance, but it tends to be a fairly conservative school, at least historically, in terms of like what it teaches. It has a very grounded curriculum, excellent fundamentals, but it didn't really teach any additive component when I was there, like at all, period. So I didn't have any background on additive going into additive. Um, but when I got into Boeing, they're like, hey, here's an additive project, go figure it out. And I'm like, all right, let's do this. Um, so I'd say, you know, with any sort of material science or metallurgist, it's, it's always got to go back to the fundamentals, right? You know, learning fundamental physical metallurgy applies no matter where you are. And those are the, those are your tools. That's your toolkit. A strong toolkit will serve you in any process because physics is physics. That's fundamentally what it is. And so if you want to try to get into additive metallurgy, um, man, I, I'd say, you know, you got to set your goal for that. Um, and in terms of getting into it, uh, man, I'd say be curious and just pursue the opportunities that arise. Right. Um, maybe there's tools you can maybe add along the way in terms of seeking internships and maybe going for certain opportunities. But the, the problem is, is not everybody's like sitting on a 3d printer. You can just go play with at your school, but, um, sort of make sure you understand the industry that you want to, go into AM for, or like if you're trying to work with some of the big companies like Boeing, right? Understand, try to learn about the aerospace, understand the target, right? Because ultimately AM is a tool, right? It is only useful when it is used properly. And so the key thing is really understanding why you're using it. And so understanding the industry that you want to apply, understanding the requirements around airplanes, uh, understanding the you know requirements around automotive, understand the industry, and then learn with those fundamentals, you'll understand how that tool is used. You can understand, you can start thinking of ideas of how would this be implemented? I, how, what gaps are there, right? Um, 
Yeah, it's tricky because it, th there is also a lag. There's no AM of metallurgy curriculum out there, right? That you can just go go do. Um, so I'd say fundamentals. Understand the industry as best you can. Uh, talk to people in it. Um, I suppose I'll, uh, you know, I, I I'm always happy to chat on uh, things like this. Uh, understand the industry, um, and then take you know legitimate steps to try to 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 get involved. Right. Um, work with your faculty. Um, follow projects. Um, understand where the industry is going. Follow the news. Um, uh, apply you know if you're an intern trying to go for an internship apply to all the internships you can um if you can't get an aerospace internship work with something that's the next best thing right find a near cousin show that you're interested show that passion and 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 really develop practice your 3d printing at home you know polymers figure out how to run your own printer understand the principles i mean th there's baby steps so just if you want something just take those steps to make yourself stand out from that next applicant i guess um i'm not uh, I don't know if that's good career advice, but it is what it is. There we go. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, Paul, thank you so much for the conversation today. Uh, I hope your inbox gets spammed with people that are reaching out. And <laughs> advice. Um, but I uh, sure. appreciate it. and look forward to maybe seeing you at uh, one of the upcoming events, or Rapid or Formnex, wherever it may be, or if, uh, if you're around Chicago. So thank you so much and, and have a great day. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you around the industry. <laughs>